from Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's The Cube, presenting the People First Network, insights from entrepreneurs and tech leaders. Everyone, welcome to the special Cube conversation. I'm John Furrier with The Cube. We're here at Mayfield Fund on Sand Hill Road, venture capital firm investing in startups here for the People First co-created pr production by SiliconANGLE the Cube and Mayfield. Next is Phil Finucan, who's the former CTO of Express Scripts as a variety of other roles. Went to Stanford, Stanford alum. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, thanks for joining me for this interview. Thank you, thank you for having me. So, before we get into some of the specifics, talk about your career, your former CTO of Express Scripts. Yep. What are some of the other journeys you've had? Talk about your roles. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had sort of a varied career. I started off as just a pure coder for a contract coder in the mid 90s. I sort of stumbled into it, not because I had a computer science background, but because uh, when you start coding, uh, sort of for fun in Silicon Valley in the mid 90s, there were just lots of jobs and I was lucky to have great mentors along the way. Um, in 2003, I joined Yahoo uh, and came in as the lead engineer and sort of the ops guy and the uh, build and release guy for the login and registration team at Yahoo. So I learned how to, went from being just a coder to being somebody who knew how to run and build big systems. Um, and manage them all around the world. That was in the day when everything was bare metal and you know, I could go to a data center and actually look at my machine and say, wow, that one's mine, right? Uh, and you know, sort of progressed from there to, to being the architect by the time that I left for some of the big social initiatives at, at Yahoo on my way out, y, um, the YOS, the uh, initiative to try to build Facebook in I think 2007, 2008 to try to take them on. It didn't work out too well, but it was yeah. definitely a formative uh, experience in my career. Uh, from there, I went to Zynga, where I was the CTO for Farmville. Um, was really, really good at getting uh, <laughs> uh, middle-aged women in the Midwest to come play that play our game, and uh, you know, was there for uh, and it was about highly three high years. growth too. Farmville huge group took growth. off yeah. like a rocket ship. We, uh, you know, over the, the ten quarters that I worked on the game, we had over a billion dollars in revenue, and that was. That, you know, the Zynga IPO'd on the back of that, right? Um, and yeah. we weren't the only game, but we were certainly that was one of the, big the, the big whale. The, us and poker were the two that really uh, drove uh, the value in, in Zynga at that point. Um, after that, I went to American Express, where I worked in a division that sort of sat off on the side of American Express, focusing on stored value products. I was the chief architect for that division, um, stored value products and uh, um, international currency exchange. Uh, so. You know, at one point I was in charge of both a, a you know, pre prepaid platform and American Express's Traveler's Checks platform, <laughs> believe it or not, a thing that still exists, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, although it's not heavily used anymore. Uh, and, you know, from, and finally I uh, went to Express Scripts where I spent the yeah. last three years as the CTO for that org. It's interesting, you got a very unique background because mm -hmm. you know, you've seen the web scale, talk about bare metal, the Yahoo yeah. days, I mean, I remember those days vividly, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with database schemas, I mean, certainly the scale of just Yahoo front page, right. never mind the, the yeah. different services that they had, which yeah. by the way, silo-like, you know, they have databases. Very, oh, totally. So building a registration and identity system must have been like really stitching together a core part of Yahoo. I mean, yeah. what a Herculean task that yeah. must have been. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. Uh, we, you know, <laughs> it was my first experience in figuring out how to deal with security around the web. Uh, you know, we had, uh, at the beginning, some vulnerabilities here and there. As time went on, um, our standards around uh, interacting around the web got better and better. Obviously, you know, Yahoo's run into trouble around that yeah. in the subsequent years, but, uh, but it was definitely a big learning experience being involved in you know the this, the development of the OAuth 2.0 spec and all of that. I was you know sort of sitting there uh, advising the folks who were you know in the middle of and it. And that doing became essentially the, yeah. the standard as we know tokens mm -hmm. dealing with Correct. tokens and SaaS really yeah. drove a lot of the SaaS mobile yeah. generation it did. in cloud, mm -hmm. which becomes kind of that next generation. So you have you know Web 1.0, mm -hmm. Web 2.0, then you have the cloud era, mm -hmm. cloud 2.0, now how to go in DevOps and apps. Right. I want to get your thoughts, and you, and you throw crypto in there just have for fun, right. you know, dealing with mm -hmm. you know, blockchain and then you know, token yep. economics and mm -hmm. new kinds of paradigms are yeah. coming online. It's, it's amazing how, uh, how far we've come in those years, right? I mean, I look at the database that was built inside of Yahoo, and this predated me. This was you know, back to circa 1996, I think. But uh, you know, big, massively scalable databases that, uh, that were needed just because the traditional relational database just wouldn't work yeah. at the, that scale. And Yahoo was one of the first to sort of discover that. And now you look uh, at the, the database technologies that are out there today that take some of those core concepts and just extend them so much further and, and there's so much uh, 
easier to, to access, to use, to run, operate, all of those things than, than back in the days of Yahoo's old UDB. Okay. And uh, it's amazing just to see how we've Phil, I want to get your come. thoughts because, you know, just thinking about the Yahoo, just your experiences and, mm -hmm. and, and even today. At that time, it was like changing the airplane's engine at 35,000 feet. It's yep. really difficult. Mm -hmm. A lot of corporate enterprises right now are having that same kind of feeling yes. with digital. Yes. Uh, digital transformation, if I say the cliche, but mm -hmm. it is true. Yep. This the impact, the role of data that's playing mm -hmm. and the the um, just for value creation, but also cybersecurity could put a company out of business. Yes. So there's all <laughs> kinds of looming things that are opportunities and challenges that are sizable, huge, Right. Task that that was once regulated to the full stack developers and the full web mm -hmm. scalers. Now the lonely CIO with the anemic enterprise staff right. has to turn around on a dime, staff up, build a stack, build commodity, scale out. This is pretty massive, not, and not a lot of it's people enormous, are talking yeah. about this. What's your view on this? Because well, this is super important. Yeah, it is, and you know, so I had kind of a shock moving from working my whole career here on Silicon Valley and then going to American Express, which. Uh, you know, is very similar in a lot of ways to Express Scripts and the sort of corporate mindset around what is technology. There's this notion that everything is IT and, you know, here in the Valley, IT is, you know, internal networks and laptops and those sorts of things. The, the stuff that's required to make your enterprise run internally, their IT is all of your infrastructure, right? Uh, and IT is a service organization. It's not the competitive advantage in your industry, right? And so both of the places that that I've gone have have had really forward-thinking leaders that have wanted to change the the way that their enterprise operates around technology to move away from IT to what I you know to technology to thinking about engineering as a core competency, um, and that's a huge change. Not only for you're the saying CIO, they did have that vision, they, they had the vision, but they didn't know how to get there. And so my charter coming in, uh, and you know others who were on the teams around me, our charter was to come in and, and help build a real engineering organization as opposed to an IT org that's you know very vendor oriented you know uh, that that's dependent on third parties to tell you the right thing or the wrong thing uh, you know that that hires consultants to come in and help set up architecture standards because we couldn't do that on our own we're not the experts on this I you know that that's sort of the mindset in, in an many old, old school companies right that uh, that needs that I think needs to change I mean that this notion that software is eating the world is still not something that people have gotten their heads around in many companies, right? And, and data is, you know, s washing out old business models. So yeah, software right? eating the world. Mm -hmm. Data is the tsunami that's coming Absolutely. in and going to take out the beach, right? And the people there, right? And so it's uh, like all of these things. It's one thing for, you know, a forward-thinking uh, CEO like Tim Wentworth at Express Scripts, uh, who was responsible for bringing me and, and the group in. Um, you know, those those kinds of folks, it's one thing to know that you have to make that transition. It's another thing to have a sense of what that means for an engineering team and all the more for the rest of the organization to be able to get behind it. I mean, yeah. people, uh, you know, I don't know, any number of business partners who have been used to just sort of taking the spec, throwing it over the wall and saying, come back to me in two years when you're done. That, that's not how effective organizations let's, work around technology. Let's drill into that because one of the things, yep. it's cultural. I mean, I, I do so many interviews on theCUBE and talk to mm -hmm. leaders all the time like yourselves and the theme keeps coming back. It's right. culture, it is. it's process, mm -hmm. technology, all those things they talk about. But culture mm -hmm. is the number one issue people point to and saying, yep. that's the reason why something did or didn't happen. Correct. So you talk about throwing it over the fence. That's mm -hmm. waterfall, right? So you think about the old waterfall methodology, mm -hmm. agile, well-documented, but the mindset of product Thinking yes. is a really novel concept to corporate America, not to Silicon Valley it is. And, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs. Right. They got to launch a product, mm -hmm. not roll out SAP right. over two years, right? Mm -hmm. or, or something mm -hmm. that they used to be doing. So now yep. this, that's a cultural it is. And mindset it's, shift. It's difficult for, for folks, even if they want to get on board, to come along some of the time. Um, one of the real big successes we had early on at Express Scripts was you know, transitioning our teams to Agile wasn't difficult. What was difficult was getting business partners to sort of come along and be actively engaged in that product development mindset and life cycle and all those sorts of things. Um, and you know, we had one partner in particular, we were migrating from a really old, really clunky customer care application that you know, had taken years and years to build, took on average a, a new agent took six weeks to get trained on it because it was so complex and it's Oracle forms and you know, every field in the database was a field on this thing and, and there, were, there were green screens yeah. to do the stuff that you couldn't do in Oracle forms. So, uh, and you know, we wanted to rebuild the application um, 
we tried to get them to come along and say, okay, we're going to do it in really small chunks, but business partners were like, no, we can't afford to have our agents swiveling between two applications. Uh, and so finally, after we got our first sort of full feature complete, we begged to go into a call center you know, with our business partners and sit down with a few agents and just have them use it and see if it looked like it worked, if it did the right thing. Uh, and it was amazing seeing uh, the business partner go over the course of an hour from, I can't be engaged in this, I don't want to agent swiveling, I don't want to be, you know, de delivering partial applications, I want the whole thing to, oh my God, it works way better, the design is much nicer, the agents seem to like it, you know, here are the next things we should work on, these are the things we got wrong, like they immediately pivoted and it wasn't, um, it wasn't because, it, it was because they're the experts, they know, you know, how to run their business, they know what's important in their call centers, they know what their agents need, um, and they were just, they just never seen the movie before, they just had no concept so that this you could is work that way. So this is actually interesting, because what you're saying is, a new thing, yeah. foreign to the <laughs> business partners, yeah. the team, the tech team's on board, right. being agile, building yeah. a product, they have to, they can't just hear the feature benefits, they got to feel it. Yeah, they have to see this it This seems to be it. the experience mm -hmm. of success yeah. before they can move. Right. Yeah. Is that a success, do you think, and culturally, something that people have to be mindful of? Uh, it's absolutely something you have to be mindful of. And that, that was just the first step down the path. I mean, that, that team made a number of mistakes that folks here, I think, in the Valley wouldn't normally make, you know, over committing and, and, and getting themselves in the deep water by trying to get too much done and actually getting less accomplished in the process because of it. And, you know, the engagement around using data to actually figure out what's the next feature that we build when you've got this enormous application that you have to migrate, you should probably have some insight as to, you know, feature by feature, what are you going to work on next? And uh, that, was a, that was a real challenge because there's, there's a culture of expertise driven, you know, being subject matter mm -hmm driven, expertise driven, as opposed to being data driven about how do you actually Let's talk about the data driven. We had a, an interview earlier uh, this morning with mm -hmm. another uh, luminary here at the Mayfield 50 uh, conference celebration that they're having. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, data is the new feedback mechanism. Yeah. And his point was is that if you treat the Agile as an R&D exercise from a data standpoint, right. not from a product, but get it out there, mm -hmm. get the data circulating in, that's yep. critical mm -hmm. in, in the formulation of the next it is, yeah, it's absolutely critical. That was uh, the eye-opener for me going to Zynga. Zynga had an incredible, probably still does have an incredible product culture that you know, every single thing gets rolled out uh, behind an experiment. Um, and so you know, that's great from an operational perspective because it allows you to you know, move quickly and roll things out in small increments and when it doesn't work, you can just shut it off and it's not some huge catastrophe. But it's also critical because uh, you know, it allows you to see what's working and what's not. And, th and the flip side of that is some humility of the people developing the products that their ideas are not going to work sometimes. Just because you know this domain well doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be the expert on exactly how everything is going to play out. And so you have to you know, have this ability to go out, try stuff, let it fail, use that, and hopefully you fail quickly, you learn what's not working, and use that to inform what's the next step down the path that you take, right? It's, you know, and Agile plays into it, but, yeah. but that's, for me, that's the big transition that corporations really have to struggle with, and it's yeah. hard. You know, you've um, been there, done that, seen multiple ways of innovation. Mm -hmm. I want to bring up uh, something to kind of get you going here. Okay. It, it's, you see this classically in the old school, you know, mm -hmm. 90s, 80s day. Product management, product people, mm -hmm. and salespeople. Yes, right. they always yeah, <laughs> button heads, you know. Uh -huh. Product marketing, marketing yep. people want this, the sales yep. marketing want this, yep. product people button heads. But now with Agile, the engineering focus has been the front lines. People mm -hmm. are building their engineering teams right. in-house. Mm -hmm. They're building custom stacks for whatever reasons. Right. The apps are getting smarter. The engineers are getting closer to the, the edge of the customer, if you will. Mm -hmm. How do you help companies, or how do you advise companies to think about the relationship between a product-centric culture mm -hmm. and a sales-centric culture. Because sometimes you have t uh, companies that are all about the customer-centric, customer-centric, right. customer-centric, product-centric, and sometimes if you try to put them together, there's always going to be an alpha, beta kind of thing there, and that's the balance in this. What's your take on this? Yeah, seems to be a cutting edge topic. Well, so, I, you know, one of the, the last big initiatives that I worked on at Express Scripts, uh, Express Scripts has the, to, to my knowledge, the largest automated uh, home delivery pharmacy in the world. It's amazing if you walk into one of our pharmacies where you know automation is packaging and you know filling prescriptions and packaging and, and shipping and doing all of that stuff. Um, and we've built so much efficiency into the process that uh, we started getting slack in the system. 
you know, every year you're trying to figure out how to make something work better and, and you know, have better automation around it. Uh, and so, you know, what do you do with all of that slack? The sales team can't sign up enough new customers for Express Scripts to actually fill that capacity. Uh, and so they created a division of commoditizing this, you know, basically white labeling your, your pharmacy. Um, we call the pharmacy as a platform, uh, exposing APIs to third parties who might want to come along and, hey, Phil's pharmacy can now fill with branded, you know, prescriptions to get sent to you in your home, right? Uh, and so it's a fantastic vision, but there was a, a real struggle between you know, engineering who had all these legacy stacks that we needed to figure out how to move to be able to really live up to this. You know, the core of Express Scripts was our members and, and not somebody else's members. And so there's a lot of rewiring at the core that needs to be done. Um, a, an operations team, uh, a product team that's you know, running these uh, home delivery pharmacies, uh, and a sales team that wants to go off and sell all over the place, right? And so you know, early on, we started off, and the sales team tried to sell like six different deals that all required different parts of the vision, but you know, they weren't really, there was no real roadmap to figure out how do you get from where we are at to the end. And we could have done any of those things, but trying to do them all at once was going to be a train wreck. And so, you know, it, we, we stubbed our toes a couple of times along the way, but I think it just came down to, you know, having a conversation and, and trying to be as transparent as possible Within on, on all sides, in all sides, to, you know, try to get to a place where we could be effective in delivering on the vision. The vision was right, and everybody was doing all of the right things, but if you haven't actually, w with so much of this stuff, if you haven't seen the movie, if you haven't worked this way before, uh, there's no... There's nothing I can tell you that's going to make it work magically for you tomorrow. Yeah. You have to just get the gotta teams together it. and work in small it's increments like and figure training. out how to get there. Right? Yeah, gotta, exactly. You got to go through spring training. Right. You got to do the reps. Yep, absolutely. Get the reps in. Yep. All right. So on your career, as you look at your what you've done in your career and what people outside are looking at right now, mm -hmm. you got startups trying to compete. Yep. And get a market position. You have other existing suppliers who could be the old guard, right. retooling, replatforming, mm -hmm. refactoring, whatever the buzzword yep. you want to use. And then the, the ultimate customer who wants to consume and have the ability of having custom personalization, data analytics, mm -hmm. unlimited elastic capability with resource right. for their solution. Mm -hmm. How, what advice would you give to the startup, to the supplier, and to the customer to survive this next transition of cloud 2.0 and the data tsunami and all the opportunities that are coming. Because if they don't, they'd be challenged. If startup goes out of business, yeah. supplier gets displaced. Right, I mean, uh, the well, so the startup, I, I don't know if I have good advice for the startup. Startups in general have to find uh, a market that actually works for them. And so, you know, I don't know that I've got some some secret key that allows startups <laughs> to be effective other than- Don't run out of money. Yeah, don't <laughs> run out of money, you know. <laughs> That's my try, favorite advice. Try to, try to figure out, you know, how to build effectively to get you to the point where you're, you know, where you're going to win, right? One of my earliest, one of the early jobs I had in my career, I came into a startup and I tried, uh, one of the founders had written the initial version of the code base. I, as a headstrong engineer, was convinced that he had done horrible work. And so I sort of holed up for like six to eight weeks, doing 100 hours a week, trying to rewrite the entire code base while getting nothing done for the startup. Uh, you know, in the end, that was the one job I've ever been fired from, and I, I, I should have been fired because, you know, honestly, as a startup, you shouldn't worry about perfection from an engineering perspective. You should figure out how to try to find your marketplace. Everybody has tech debt. You can fix that as time goes on. You know, the startup needs to figure out how to be viable more than anything else. Um, as far as suppliers go, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's interesting the you know, I sort of look at corporate America and there are many, many companies that really rely heavily on their vendors to tell them how to do things. They don't trust in their own internal engineering ability. And so, and then there are the ones, like the teams that I've built at Amex and, and Express Scripts that, that really do want to learn it all and, and be independent. I would say identify when you walk into somebody's shop, which they are, and sell to them appropriately. I, you know, I've been a Splunk customer for a long time. I love Splunk. Um, but the uh, Splunk sales team early on at Express Scripts tried to come in and sell me on a whole bunch of stuff that Splunk was just not good at, right? Uh, and you knew that. And I knew that because I've been a hands-on customer ever since Zynga, <laughs> right? I know what it's good at, um, and, and I love it as a tool, but, uh, you know, it's... It's not not the, the the Swiss Army knife. It can't do everything. Well, now you got signal effects, so that now you can get what the observability you need. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, uh, 
so yeah, I um, you know I, I would say you know for for those kinds of companies, it's important to go in and and understand what your customer is you know what your customer is asking for and respond to them appropriately. And in some cases, they're going to need your expertise either because they're building towards it or they haven't gotten there yet. In some cases, um, one of the things that I've done with teams of mine in the past what was it with App Dynamics at uh, at Express Script excuse me at Amex. Uh, five or six years ago, they were sold on, you know, bringing in AppDynamics as a monitoring tool. I actually made them not bring it in because they didn't know what they didn't know. I made them go build some basic monitoring, you know, using some open source tools just to get some background. And then, you know, once they did, we ended up bringing that AppDynamics in, but doing it in a way that they were, you know, accretive to what we were trying to accomplish and not just this thing that was going to solve all of our problems. Yeah, so that brings up the whole off the shelf, general mm -hmm. purpose right. software model that mm -hmm. you kind of you're referring to. That right. The old model was lean on your vendors. Right. They're supplying you, so you yep. lean on them because you don't have the staff to do it yourself. Correct. That's changing. Do you think it that's is. changing? It is. It's uh, it's changing, but again, I think there's a lot of places where people nominally want to go there, but don't know how to get there. Right. And so, uh, you know, people are stubbing their toes left and right, and that's you know that's if you're doing it with this mindset of we're, we're constantly getting better and we're learning um, and it's okay to make mistakes as it's long okay as we It's okay to stub your toe forward. if you don't cut up an artery open. Yeah, that's <laughs> true, know? yeah, exactly. You don't right? want to bleed out, that's, right. a, that's a cyber security hack. That's you know? true, that's true. Uh, well, I mean, but uh, yeah. for me a lot of the time that just comes down to how long are you waiting before you stub your toe. If you're, you know, uh, if you wait two years before you actually try to launch something, the odds of you cutting your leg off are much higher than... Uh, well, I want to get into the failure thing because I think stubbing your toe brings up this notion of mm -hmm. risk management, learning yeah. what to to try, what not to do, take experiments to try to, yep. your app dynamics is a great example. Mm -hmm. Before we get there, you mentioned suppliers. One of the things we're hearing, I want to get your thoughts on this, is that um, a lot of C CIOs and CISOs, or, or mm -hmm. CDOs, whatever title of this acronym, yep. um, they're trying to reduce the number of suppliers. They don't want more tools, right? They don't necessarily want another tool yeah. for the tool's sake. Or they might want to replatform. What does that even mean? So we're hearing, in our interviews and in our in our discussions with practitioners, that you know, hey, I want to get my suppliers down. Oh, by the way, I want to be API driven. So I want right. to I want to start getting into a mode where I'm dictating the relationship to suppliers. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Do you see that as uh, aspirational, real dynamic, or fiction? Uh, um, it's it's a good goal. It's good motivation. I believe it. Um, for me, I approach the problem a little bit differently. Uh, I'm a big believer. Well, so because I've seen this pattern of this next tool is going to be the one that consolidates three things and it's going to be the right answer. Um, and instead of eliminating three and getting down to one, you have four because you're, you know, you need to unwire this new thing. There's a lot of time and effort required to, to get rid of, you know, your old technology stack and, and move to the new one, right? I've seen that especially coming from um, the CISA for, for Express Scripts is an amazing guy uh, and, you know, was definitely trying to head down that path, but we stubbed our toes. We ran into problems in trying to figure out, you know, how do you move from, you know, one set of networking gear to the next set? How do you deal with, you know, all of the uh, the virus protection and all the other? The, there's this huge so it's not variety just of tools. Dead, it's disruption. Yeah, it's disruption to the existing stack, and you've got to move from old to new. So my philosophy has always been, with technical debt, you know, when you're in debt, um, and I think technical debt really does operate in a lot of ways like real debt, right? probably good to have some of it. Um, if you're completely debt free, that's, uh, that's I've, I've never been in that place before. Um, you're comfortable. Uh, yeah, you might not be moving. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you might be on the beach sitting right, on the beach. Exactly, right, exactly, <laughs> um, right. But uh, you know, with that technical debt, um, you know, there's two ways to get to pay down your debt. You can scrimp and save and and put more money into debt, you know, principal payments as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to spending on other new things or, well, and or, uh, build productive capacity. And so a huge focus for me for the engineering teams that we build, yeah. and this is not anything new to folks in this area, but you know, always think about an arms race where you're getting 1% uh, better every day. The aggregation of marginal gains and you know, investing internal yeah. improvements so that your team is doubling productivity every year, which is something that's really possible for yeah. you know, uh, some of these engineering organizations uh, is, is the way that you that you deal with that, right? If you get to the point where your team is really, really productive, they can go through and eliminate all the old legacy That's technology. That's actually great and advice, and it's interesting because a lot of people just get hung up on one thing, operating yep. something, right. and then growing something. Yep. You can, and you can have different management styles and different yep. techniques for both, the growth team and yep. operating team. You're kind of bringing in and saying, we can do both. Yeah, Operate with growth can. in mind you, to your 1% better right. approach. And, you know, and for me, it's been uh, an interesting journey. You know, I started off as the engineer and then the architect who was always focused on just the technology, the design of the system in production. 
sort of learned from there that you had to be good at the, you know, all the systems that get code from a developer's desktop into production. That's a whole interrelated system that's not uh, isolated from your production system. And then from there, it has to be the, you know, the engineering team that you build has to be effective as well. And so I've moved from being very technology centric to somebody who says, okay, I have to start with getting the team right and getting the culture right if we're ever going to be able to get the technology to a good place. Mind you, I. I still love the technology. I'm, I'm still an architect at my core, but I've come to this realization that uh, good technology and bad teams will get crushed yeah. by, by bad technologies and good teams. Because I've now seen that in a couple of places where you have old but evolving technology stacks that have gone from low availability and poor performance and low ability to get new features into production to a place where yes. you're fixing all of that at a high rate. It's but interesting, it starts you're, with the you're, team. you're bringing some core Silicon Valley ethos into the yeah. IT conversation because what's you're talking about is, I'll fund an A team with a B plan any day over right. a, uh, Absolutely. a B team with an A plan. Right. And, and where this makes sense, I think is true, is that to your point about debt, mm -hmm. A teams know how to manage it. Yeah. So this Absolutely. is kind of what you're getting at here. Right. You can take that same ethos. Mm -hmm. So it's the agile enterprise. Yeah, That's it is. That's what we're talking Absolutely. about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hypothetical final point I want to chat with you about. Okay. Let's just say you and I were starting a company. Okay. With chief architect, you're the chief architect, I'm coder. Right. What are we doing? Do I go horizontally scalable cloud? Certainly cloud native. How would you think about building, we have an app in mind, all the requirements are defined, it's going to be data centric, it's going to be game change, it have community, it might have some crypto in there, yeah. who knows, right? right. Well, it's going to be fun. How do we scale this up to be really fast? How would you architect it? Yeah, I, well, you know, I do start you know, in the cloud, I go to, to AWS or Azure, or, you know, any of the offerings that are out there and you know, leverage everything that they have that's already wired up already for you. I mean, the, the thing that we've seen in uh, the evolution of software and, and um, production systems over the last, well, forever, is you get more and more leverage every day, every year, right? Um, and so, you know, if you and I are starting a, a new company, let's go use the tools that are there to do the things that, uh, that we shouldn't be wasting our time on. Let's focus on the value for our company as much as we can. Don't, don't over-architect. Uh, I think premature optimization is a thing that you know, I learned early on is a real problem. You should, you know. Give an example of what that looked like. Uh, I've seen teams. Database scale decisions done with no scale. <laughs> Correct, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you go off and you Let's you pick build this database, it's the most scalable database. Well, we have no users yet. Right, you, you, <laughs> you, build, the th you, know, you build the super complicated, you know, cache, caching architecture, or you, know, you go design the, the most critical part of the system out of the gate, you know, uh, using assembly. You know, you use C++ or you, know, you use a, a, you know, a low level language when a high level language with your three users would be just fine, right? You know, you can get the work done in a fraction of the time. And get the business logic down. Correct. The IP. Right. Solve the problem when it becomes a problem. Like it's, you know, I, I've, any number of times I've, I've run into systems, I've built systems where you, uh, you have some issue that you run into and you have to go back and redesign some chunk of the system. Um, in my experience, I'm really bad at predicting, and I think in general engineers are really bad at predicting what are going to be the problem areas until you run into them. So just go as simple as you can out of the gate. You know, use as many tools as you can to, to solve problems that, you know, maybe as an engineer, I want to go rebuild everything from scratch every time. I get the inclination, yeah. uh, but it's... Uh, it's a knee-jerk reaction to do that, but if you stay your course, don't over-provision, overthink right. it. Just start taking steps towards the, right. the destination you want, the division you want to go to, right. and get better. S solve operate. the problem that you have when it shows up. So and growth mindset, execute, mm -hmm. solve the problems when they're there. Right, and initially the problem that you have is finding a market, not you know building the the greatest uh, platform in the world. Right, find a market exactly. Right, Phil, thanks for taking the time. Thank appreciate you very much. Insights. Appreciate it. Hey, we're here for the People First Mayfield's 50th celebration, 50 years in business. It's a Cube co-production. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. Thanks, John.